Conducted by a special committee appointed to investigate a disputed August roll call vote on agriculture spending. This is a little more than two hours. Uh, without objection, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. Uh, let me begin with a, uh, a brief uh, statement. Uh, first, let me say that I think that today's hearing is a, an important hearing. Um, one of the main things that I was struck with as I began um, delving into the uh, substantive aspects of uh, this inquiry, uh, which is mentioned in the Select Committee's interim report, uh, in includes the duties and, and discretion of the officers of the House and the presiding officer related to voting and the duration of the vote, is that the rules of the House the House standing rules, that is, uh, that govern the conduct of an electronic vote only provide uh, illumination on certain aspects of the subject. Uh, I had previously been unaware uh, to which electronic votes are governed by uh, precedents and customs that uh, I dare say few of us were aware of and understand. Um, Clause 2A of uh, Rule 20 states, and I'm quoting, uh, except as otherwise permitted under Clause 8 and 9 of this rule or under Clause 6 uh, of Rule 28, or rather 18, uh, the minimum time for a record vote, a quorum call by electronic voting, uh, shall be 15 minutes. Uh, clause 1 of Rule 20 states that on a tie vote, a question fails. Um, that seems to be it. Uh, so much of what occurs on the floor of the House uh, is governed by precedents, customs, and, and practice. Uh, therefore, uh, much of what dictates the sequence of events that comprise a floor vote uh, is not black letter law. Uh, and it would appear that some of it is not even memorialized in writing. So that's why uh, today is a particularly important hearing, the uh, purpose of which is to inform the members of the committee and uh, I dare say uh, our colleagues outside of this committee, as well as the American uh, people, as of the custom and practice and precedents that influence uh, in, in many ways goes to uh, the heart of this institution. And I can't think of anyone more prepared to serve as witnesses at this hearing than the two individuals who uh, sit before us and who I will introduce momentarily. Uh, first, let me say that I'm confident that the information that will emerge from this hearing will be integral and lame the foundation for the factual inquiry with which we are charged. Um, the subject of the hearing is institutional knowledge that has, that has, that as has been with the subjects of the committee's previous hearing is not within the immediate expertise of many members and is therefore critical for us to understand in fulfilling uh, our charge. Uh, however, I'm also uh, inquisitive as to how we may inform uh, our other responsibility, which is the uh, recommendation of changes uh, to the House rules. One of the most valuable uh, things I think we will take away from this experience is that 
is the understanding of the most integral or innermost operations of the House of Representatives, the institution, if you will. Because the greater our understanding of not only the meaning of the rules, customs, and practice, but also the reason and history behind them, and our determination that their operation and purpose are generally fair and logical, uh, if we so determine, uh, the greater our commitment to preserving their integrity. Um, let me call on uh, Mr. Pence for his opening statement. Chairman, before you yield open. to Mr. Pence, uh, you might want to supplement the record in that we have had a meeting, the select committee, that wasn't public. Uh, when we met on the floor through the walkthrough, perhaps just if you could get a, a brief recitation, so the, the, in that the press was not allowed to accompany, that, uh, accompany us on the floor, uh, that we actually saw for ourselves the process. Uh, uh, that's a, a very good point, uh, uh, Mr. Halshuk. We, we did, I think it was a week ago, uh, have a, an opportunity to, uh, to actually observe uh, and participate uh, in, a, um, in a vote, um, not a real vote, obviously, but a, a, a vote that was, uh, I think, most illuminating, uh, which ran through the various sequences uh, that the offices uh, of the clerk's uh, office and, and, and the parliamentarian explained in, 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 some, in, in some great detail. Uh, I think we all left uh, that floor uh, having a greater appreciation uh, for the coordination that's required uh, between uh, the various uh, individuals uh, that conduct, if you will, uh, the operations that make the House of Representatives function uh, as, a, uh, as a democratic institution. Um, I see the uh, Clerk of the House, Lorraine Miller, has, uh, has joined us, and I want to commend and extend our collective uh, appreciation for that particular uh, effort. It, it really uh, was illuminating. And again, I would say that I think we all left uh, uh, with a, uh, a better appreciation of the complexity and the coordination that's required. Um, and now, Mr. Pence. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you for uh, uh, calling this third uh, hearing. I, I would uh, agree with you that uh, what we are about in this third hearing, as we've been about in the first two, is institutional knowledge. And uh, uh, I am uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the, uh, uh, the manner with which this committee has uh, cooperated uh, thus far, and, and uh, uh, hope and trust that we will remain cordial uh, and collegial as we move out of, of, uh, of this background institutional knowledge phase into upcoming hearings that will be exploring the facts and circumstances around uh, the uh, vote of August 2nd, 2007. Uh, the, as you said, this is the third uh, in a series of educational hearings about the voting process. Uh, we've heard from the clerk, as you just mentioned, we've been on the House floor, we've received a briefing on the voting process. Today our hearing uh, I expect uh, uh, we'll delve deeply into rules, procedures, precedents, customs, and practices associated with voting in the House. Uh, our witnesses uh, are, uh, are two individuals with extraordinary experience and knowledge, uh, and I might add extraordinary uh, reputations um, for integrity uh, in this institution. And uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to, to welcome them to the Select Committee and thank them for their um, for their long <coughs> careers of service uh, to the United States and to this institution. Um, uh, I, I'll leave to the chair to introduce our, our two witnesses, but uh, when I think about the, the cumulative uh, weight of the years of experience assembled at this table, uh, uh, I am uh, encouraged that we will uh, leave this hearing uh, better informed and, and, and with, a, with a much greater appreciation for the proper work of the House of Representatives in the tallying of a vote uh, than we had uh, even up to this point. 
Uh, let, let me say, uh, again, I appreciate the collegial manner, particularly the chairman uh, and my Democrat colleagues have demonstrated to those of us uh, on the Republican side. We have serious business to do here, and, uh, uh, and I, I'm grateful that uh, we are taking it seriously. Uh, uh, because there are some tough questions ahead. The reality is that even in this educational background phase, uh, questions have been raised that need to be answered. Today, I expect more questions will come to our mind as we hear from these experts, but uh, uh, I remain confident that we are building a good foundation of knowledge on which we will be able uh, to draw substantive conclusions uh, about the events of the night of August 2nd. And finding answers is really what we're here to do. Our select committee has been tasked with two jobs, getting to the bottom of what happened on the night of August 2nd, 2007, during roll call vote 814, and making recommendations to the House regarding the protection of members' voting franchise in the House voting system. This is a solemn duty uh, to investigate the irregularities of August 2nd, and uh, we approach it in that manner. The integrity of the House of Representatives is completely dependent on the integrity of the vote that takes place on the floor of the House. Every American is entitled to have a voice in the people's house and to know that their representative's vote counts. With our work today and over the past few weeks, I believe we're taking the proper foundational steps to answer the questions we have about that night and, and to uh, uh, develop the kind of recommendations that will ensure the fundamental integrity of this institution. So, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing. I thank our witnesses and look forward to the testimony. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Pence. And let me proceed uh, by introducing our witnesses. Uh, and as you indicated, these are, uh, are individuals of great integrity and, and erudition. Uh, their reputations are, are well known to all of us. Uh, Mark O'Sullivan uh, received his Bachelor of Arts at the University of Massachusetts. Everybody mentions it. Yeah. <laughs> In 1975, Mark is a member of the Red Sox Nation. <laughs> he has served the House of Representatives since 1977 in the House Post Office, Office of the Doorkeeper, and Office of the Clerk, uh, Legislative Operations. In 1978, uh, Mark was appointed Assistant Tally Clerk and served in this position until 1983. From 1983 to 1987, Mr. O'Sullivan served as Assistant Journal Clerk. He returned to, to position of Tally Clerk and, until January of 2003 when he was appointed Chief Tally Clerk, a position which he currently serves with great respect from all members of the House. And uh, again, alluding back to uh, the, the, brief, the, the hearing that was conducted on the floor of the House, um, we, uh, I, I certainly, and I think I speak for most of the members, uh, have now a uh, much more uh, fully, uh, well, I have a much greater appreciation for the function of the tally clerk. Um, in this position, uh, he's responsible for the electronic voting system, which records members' votes on the House floor and for authorizing the release of roll call votes to the clerk's website and the government <coughs> printing office for printing in the congressional record. He supervises a staff of four assistant tally slash floor action uh, reporting uh, system clerks. Uh, he has served under six House speakers, seven House clerks, and three House parliamentarians. We're also fortunate to have one of those distinguished parliamentarians here with us today, Charlie Johnson, uh, received his Bachelor of Arts from Amherst College, also in Massachusetts, obviously part of Red Sox Nation, <laughs> and his Juris Doctor from the University of Virginia Law School in 1963. He's admitted to practice in the bars of the District of Columbia and the United States. State Supreme Court. He served in the Army National Guard, uh, Army Reserve from 1963 to 1966, and the Navy JAG Reserve Commission from 1967 to 1971. 
He was appointed to the office of the Parliamentarian of the House of Representatives in May of 1964. He served as assistant parliamentarian from 1964 to 1974. From 1974 to 1994, he served as deputy parliamentarian. He then served as parliamentarian of the House from September 16, 1994 through May 20, 2004, 40 years, 40 years uh, to the day after his first appointment. He has served as an adjunct professor on congressional procedure, political leadership, and recent congressional history at the University of Virginia uh, Law School, and given lectures and seminars at numerous institutions, including his alma mater, uh, Amherst College, Catholic University Law School, and Georgetown University Law School. He has been the editor or author of numerous publications, he was the editor of House Rules and Manual for the 104th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th Congresses. He co-edited House Practice, the second edition. He is currently consulting to the parliamentarian on the writing of House Precedent. He is also the co-author with Sir William McKay, recently retired clerk of the House of Commons, of an upcoming book on Parliament and Congress. And lastly, he has been a batting practice pitcher with the LA Dodgers and the Pittsburgh Pirates for the past five years. Congratulations, John. But they're not in the World Series. <laughs> um, the Atlanta Braves could use a middle reliever. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, could I, before the witnesses, could I just add something about Mr. Johnson? Uh, because part of the, this committee's assignment is to serve as an educational tool for members. I, I just want to relate an experience that, that I had when I was elected in 1994. Uh, I'd never been in the legislature, and I got here, and some of the old bulls uh, roused to then Speaker Gingrich, why the Democrats parliamentarian, uh, who was Charlie Johnson. Uh, and they said, why we're in the majority now. We, we shouldn't be keeping the Democrats parliamentarian. I, I think your introduction uh, of Mr. Johnson is, is right on the money. And over the, the 12 years that I had the pleasure to preside from time to time. He wasn't a Democrat's parliamentarian. He, he was a parliamentarian of the House. Uh, and uh, uh, his counsel was, and why I thought, and Mr. Davis thought, he was such a valuable witness. Is what he has to say about the rules, practices, and precedents, I think it's unimpeachable. Uh, and he's going to be fair. Uh, and I would also like to tip my hat to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, in that I see that you have sought counsel of one of his former assistants, Tia McCartan, and I had the pleasure to work with her. 12 years, and I would make the same statement about her. What she says are the rules, the practices, procedures. I'm going to believe that and trust that. And so I'm looking forward to this hearing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Latourette. And let me just echo that the, the, the people that are before us uh, and the people that are sitting in this audience who are part of the operations of this house and the people that are behind us, um, why they might be appointed by Democrats or Republicans, um, I, I think it's I think it's important for the American people to understand um, that they're institutionalists um, and they care about this institution. I think all of us are aware of that because in many cases we have personal relationships with these individuals and they carry out their duties in a nonpartisan way. And I know that the testimony that we will elicit from them will be fair and accurate uh, and will be made in a way uh, that hopefully will uh, be reflected in our final product, which will enhance the confidence of the American people in the integrity of this institution. Um, we've said that differently in different ways, all of us, but that's why we're here. Um, I know that neither, uh, neither one of uh, our witnesses uh, have a written statement, so why don't we just simply go to, to questions first uh, and let me pose a, a, a question to um, uh, Mr. Johnson. Charlie, in, 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 in Chapter 50, Section 2 of, of your book, um, entitled House Practice, uh, A Guide to the Rules, and Precedents, and Procedures of the House, there's this statement, parliamentary law, a term that encompasses both formal rules and usages. 
has come to be recognized as binding on the assembly and its members. Um, the formal rules, which are our standing rules, uh, are readily available in two different House publications. The chair's interpretation of those standing rules have, has been compiled. Um, we know where we can go and get it. Uh, thanks to the dedication of the office of the, the parliamentarian over, over an extensive period of time, many years, to create a body of precedent that, that gives us some clarity and predictability in the application of the standing rules themselves. But when it comes to the usages or, or customs of the House that govern procedure, they're not completely captured, if you will, in the compilation of, pres of precedents and uh, other publications setting forth the standing rules. Um, as stated by uh, Mr. Hines, the parliamentarian in the early uh, 1990s, these customs are the unwritten law. And I'm, that, that's his term, unwritten law. I mean, that's quotes around unwritten. Um, and we, we hope to glean some of those usages and customs of the House today. Um, but before we embark on that journey, can, can you please explain to the committee the relative importance of usage and, and, and custom? Um, when does a custom of usage become so well established so that it's elevated uh, to be a binding procedural rule? Um, is it as binding as a well-settled uh, rule of the chair, uh, a standing rule, if you will? Um, and would your answer be different if the chair had occasion uh, to opine uh, <coughs> on a usage or, or, or custom. Um, can you discuss the uh, prominence of custom and usage in the Morden House, uh, where the majority of members have only been here since 1999? I myself came here in January 1997. Um, how does the House? go about changing uh, a usage or, or custom? Uh, I mean, can the uh, chair, by deviating from a usage or custom, establish a, a, a new precedent? Or how do we go about changing usage and custom? Mr. John? I'm sorry. Am I on? Uh, it, perhaps it's not totally accurate to say that all usage and custom is not written, because just in the last few days, as I've tried to collect my thoughts in preparation for this hearing, I went back into Hines and Cannon's precedent, beginning where you just did, with our own practice book, which has a three-page chapter on precedent. And the first citation in that chapter, which you cited, brings you to Heinz Precedents, Volume 1, the preface. Now, what are Heinz and Cannon's Precedents? They are the compilations, respectively, from, 19, uh, from 18, 1789 until 1905, when Asher Heinz, uh, during his time as then clerk to the speaker's table, and the predecessor didn't have the title of parliamentarian, and then a member of Congress, uh, took uh, Thomas Reed's seat from Maine in the late uh, 1890s. But he had it within him to, uh, with whatever staff he could summon, to publish those first five volumes. And they speak volumes. And uh, you, you read briefly the unwritten law. Mm -hmm commentary in his preface, but let me, let me put this in a little more context, because custom and usage is contextual. And the P 
people who have immediate access to it are perhaps people like myself and others and staff on both sides. And I see right here today there are distinguished staff on both sides who have access and interest in looking at precedent, at black letter rule, precedent, custom uses. And, but there, there's more available than meets the eye, and that's part of what the House realized in 19, Congress realized in 1970 when the law was amended. The Reorganization Act of 70 requires uh, the parliamentarian who, uh, by law, is appointed by the Speaker as a nonpartisan attorney, together with all the assistant parliamentarians as nonpartisan attorneys to compile the procedural precedents of the House. At that time, they had not been compiled since Cannon finished his compilation through 1936. They had not been fully compiled as precedent. There were citations in the House manual and in a abbreviated book called Cannon's Procedure and then uh, with uh, cryptic citations. And as you all, I think, just last week received your once again, your leather-bound rule books. Small print in there is often is citation to precedent for the most part. Rulings of the presiding officers, which perhaps have a little greater standing because they are potentially subject to uh, the will of the House through appeal. Now, when I retired in May, on May 20th of 04, I spent a lot of time working on a two-page letter that letter discussed uh, the importance of precedent. It honored the people I had been privileged to help advise. And it said that uh, appeals from rulings had traditionally not been taken in the House because uh, the chair's fairness has been honored as a tradition and custom. And I still think that's true, and it has to be. But as you know, all of six of you know, there have been a proliferation of appeals from rulings, perhaps not so much to have a vote of the House on the propriety of the chair's ruling, which after all is all that an appeal is about, but rather from time to time to get, or to, be, to claim to get a vote on the underlying substance of the proposition, which I think is, is wrong as far as using appeals. But, Let's face it, it's happened, and it will, it will <clears throat> continue to happen. But those, uh, when those rulings are made by the Speaker, and 9 out of 10 are not appealed, they are then uh, incorporated in the House manual uh, every two years. They then go into the House practice book. The uh, second edition is out. It's been out since 03. My predecessor, Bill Brown, and I put it and our staff. But then there are precedent, there are traditions and customs. Let me just read this paragraph from which you quoted. The value of, and this is out of, out of Asher Hines' introduction. The value of precedents in guiding the action of a legislative body has been demonstrated by the experience of the House of Representatives for too many years to justify any arguments in their favor now. We have no other means of building up parliamentary law, either in the mother country or here, said a great lawyer who was also an experienced legislator. And the, the quote, unfortunately, is of a senator. So I, <laughs> you can minimize the presidential value, but the senator was speaking of, par of president value of president. Except by instances as they arise and treatment of them and disposition of the law and of the good reasons that should govern these considerations. And the great legislature, who had, legislator who had served a lifetime in the House of Representatives and the Senate, concluded that, as you quoted from, and this was another senator, John Sherman, in the 44th Congress, concluded that, quote, the great body of the rules of all parliamentary bodies are unwritten law. They spring up by precedent and custom. These precedents and customs are this day the chief law of both houses of Congress. So that I think that really does 
properly characterize the value of precedent, of uh, practice. The question is, what, Charlie, how do they read it? If I can, let me answer. Do you agree with that statement? Yes. And, but I don't agree that they're not necessarily unwritten. They are published often, not always, but often in the precedents, in footnotes, in, uh, in the House practice book, as parliamentarians' notes, not as positive precedent, but as guides. And the reason they have value is because they're prepared by an office which, by law and unbroken custom, has the responsibility of, as nonpartisan attorneys of preparing them and publishing them. That was the law in 1970. Ongoing publication. If I can again interrupt, but is there a discrete compilation or a compendium uh, that is readily available uh, to members? It's, uh, in other words, let, let me rephrase it for, for someone who is not particularly conversant with parliamentary procedure. And that depends on the individual member. But I dare say that there are many members who fit that particular description. Um, but if on occasion they wanted to access, without going to the parliamentarian's office, how would you go about it? How would you, how would you, uh, you know, uh, locate the, the precedent are on a particular issue that you were concerned about? Well, all the precedents from Hines, Cannon, Deschler, Deschler Brown are online. Hines precedents, Cannon's precedents are all online. There are, and plus, there are 11 volumes of Hines and Cannon's precedents from 1789 through 36. Then there are now 16 volumes of Deschler and Deschler Brown. Lou Deschler was parliamentary for 46 years, from 1928 through 74. He hired me. And obviously, um, being the parliamentarian for 46 years gave him some stature. He also, for most of his time, had rather limited, uh, did not permit uninhibited access to his scrapbooks and presidents as he compiled them. The law came along in 70 and required publication total member access, which was right. Mm -hmm. But they're there. The and the, the problem is one, I said, the question is, how many people, number one, know they're there, and how to access, uh, access them, and sometimes seek help in accessing them? Which, again, the parliamentarian's office is available to do on a confidential basis in an attorney-client uh, relationship if necessary. So. That's not to say members and staff can't do their own uh, their own research, and they often do. They're well advised, I think, to seek uh, their interpretation of the results of that research from the parliamentarian's office and from other sources. There are sources that are clearly uh, have expertise, both on committee staff, CRS, uh, where where help can be gained. But in the content, let me just read. It. I talk about precedent. And I, I started looking a couple of days ago for a precedent in this general area of voting. Because I knew, since I was here in 64, that the, the uh, voting system uh, until from 64 through 73 was the roll call. That was how the A's and A's were recorded. And it was done on tally sheets. And this is, this is really kind of fascinating. Be, and because it's really the only that I could find printed discussion of the role of the clerks in preparing the result. And it, uh, it was an occasion in 1918, and this, this is in Canon's volume 8, section 3162. And as I say, this is in print. This is, this is usage, but it's also precedent because the chair has, was called upon to rule on a, an occasion when a conference report was defeated, 149 to 150. The next day, it became apparent that the clerk's tally was wrong with one vote, and that the correct vote was 150 to 149, adopting the conference report. Clearly a decisive change. 
And so the, the issue came up that, uh, about changing the journal and, in effect, approving the conference report, which the day prior the speaker had declared to have been rejected. And Cannon uh, wrote that we're an era of the clerk in reporting the A's and A's, the speaker announces a result where by an era of the clerk, the speaker announces a result different from that shown by the roll. The status of the question must be determined by the vote as actually recorded. And then they went ahead and amended the journal. But let me just read a paragraph. This is it's really, in a, in a uh, general way, touches on where you folks, I believe, are headed. The chair, and this is Speaker Champ Clark of Missouri, a distinguished Speaker of the House in 1918. The chair, with the consent of the House, would like to make a few remarks about this matter. See, these are remarks. This is this is not a ruling precisely because the House did not challenge the amendment of the journal because everyone knew that the, the, the revised tally sheet was the correct one. But the chair of the speaker felt it necessary to make this comment. Uh, this is the first time for a long time, while that this has been done, and perhaps not a dozen men in the House ever saw the thing done before. And, but this is not unprecedented. Now, the way the chair arrives at a yay and nay vote in the House is by these tally clerks handing up the figures. Of course, the chair cannot go down there and count the votes and would not know how to do it if he did go down there. They're, they're, they have some system of their own whereby when they get through with the roll, they know the number of the yays and nays and those present. And then these clerks at the desk take the tally sheet out and go over it. One of them a Democrat and one of them a Republican. And I never heard of anybody that disputed the integrity of either. So there's the a description which uh, captures uh, until 1973, a uh, hundred and whatever many years, 90 years of, pr of practice and present that two tally clerks, and there's still two uh, proceeding. Whether they're patronage, one Democrat, one Republican, I don't think is particularly relevant. But the important thing is that the role of the tally clerks has traditionally been nonpartisan, as Speaker Champ Clark has said, and as is then thereby recorded as a usage, as a custom of the House. And when the House went to electronic voting, that role was never perceived to be changed, the role of the tally clerk in, uh, in compiling the result was, uh, was not considered to be uh, sufficiently different to require a black letter commentary on what the ongoing role of the tally clerks was to be. The uh, assumption, again, the precedent, the tradition, and custom was always, as Speaker Clark said, that he never remembered uh, the tally clerk's result. Yes, sometimes errors, but never, uh, never guided uh, by anything other than the proper uh, role of, uh, of clerks. Uh, that um, that he, that was the custom and remains so, I believe. And so, uh, since electronic voting, and I saw it come in, I said it came in gradually first two or three years of getting away from the A's and A's, which took 45, 45 minutes, they, they came up with a system called recorded tellers, and it's still a fallback procedure in the book, in the uh, rules, whereby the A's went up the left aisle, the A's went up the right aisle, and, and clerks separately tallied with two separate sheets the, the result. That was, that was when the House uh, began to allow other uh, voting in the Committee of the Whole, one, uh, recorded voting in the Committee of the Whole, which was a huge reform in 1970 in the Legislative Reorganization Act. The amendments were not roll called in the Committee of the Whole. And so defeated amendments were not a matter of record. And so the House, in its wisdom, decided to allow uh, recorded votes in the Committee of the Whole. And this, they didn't have electronic voting, but they knew that the call of the A's and A's was going to take a long time on amendments in the Committee of the Whole especially back when there were open rules, and you had a number of amendments and amendments to amendments voted on in real time. So they come up with this 
temporary, uh, all the while uh, having a contract to find an electronic voting system that worked. But in those few years, the tallies were kept separately up each aisle, and then the numbers were reported by the members who were, had been appointed by the speaker as tellers or the chairman of the committee of the whole and announced separately the yeas and the nays. But once electronic voting uh, kicked in, uh, the, the tally clerks again at the roster were expected and <coughs> invariably prepared that final result on a sheet. And I, I assume in your walkthrough the other day, you saw that process in action as indispensable. Uh, you saw the preparation of that tally sheet uh, deriving from the electronic mechanism. But since then, I'm not aware. There was one occasion in 95 cited again this is precedent it's in volume 14 of deschler brown uh it involved as uh, as uh, congressman lots read may recall a situation which is very important where the chair on a an amendment in the committee of the whole uh announced the result with a slip of 213 to 214. we're talking numbers that seem to relate i suppose uh on an amendment just as two minority members were approaching down the two different aisles. And the chair with the slip in his hand, because the tally clerk at that moment when he handed up the slip was not aware that those members were coming in. And as he handed up the slip, two members appeared and the chair using the slip announced, uh, it would not allow those two members to vote and announced the result as 213 to 214. Well, the minority, uh, Peter Gephardt and, and the minority were quite upset. And the House adjourned, the committee rose immediately, the House adjourned, and there was going to be a, a refusal to, pr to proceed until that vote was rescinded. And the, and the Speaker, Speaker Gingrich and uh, Majority Leader Army readily agreed that uh, for the sake of the institution, getting on with business, the uh, unanimous consent in the House, the vote was rescinded and taken again. The next day, but that's the only occasion of of, uh, of that kind of problem that I can remember. Uh, it wasn't a select committee as a result of. There was no question of privilege. There was no select committee uh, result. Right. It was worked out uh, by a, by a rescission of the action the next day. Um, I'm I'm going to go to uh, my ranking member and a friend from Indiana. Uh, I also am going to uh, apologize to both of you uh, and to my colleagues. If I have a, a very significant meeting that I'm already late for, so I'm going to excuse myself and I'll hand the gavel over to, uh, to Mr. Davis. Thank you, Chairman. And, uh, I. Uh, I, I have to uh, uh, confess that uh, I have not spent uh, very much time um, in the former parliamentarian's company, um, and I, I haven't been. Uh, uh, th this challenge since my first day of law school. I thank you for your your uh, thoughtful and careful presentation of. Uh, the assumptions, the precedents, the traditions, the customs um, of the House of Representatives about voting. I, I also want to say I, I appreciate you helping this committee and anyone that might look into this hearing in the future to understand the weight of history on this institution, which is an, an, a, a thus far successful, unbroken commitment to democracy. And um, uh, and that uh, I'm, I'm uh, I, just, I feel uh, a little bit of an extra burden about that weight of history in this moment, uh, by virtue of your testimony. Let me, uh, uh, if I can, let me focus on on a, a couple of uh, a big picture issues. I'm I'm open to um, Rule Twenty, and Mr. Johnson. Uh, 
I specifically wanted to ask you, but but, I, but uh, Mr. O'Sullivan may have an opportunity to, to jump into this. The, the the express language here is, unless the speaker directs otherwise, the clerk shall conduct a record voter quorum call by electronic device in such cases, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I guess the first and, and foundational question that I have uh, is, um, what does what does the language the clerk shall conduct a record vote mean, and and I guess by that I, I want to get specifically to the issue of, of who controls the floor, uh, who conducts a vote. Uh, in in the plainest sense of the terms, it seems to me that uh, in your testimony today and reflecting on historical precedent, um, that that the tally clerks play a critical role. Um, that uh, that in fact I was I was amused at speaker. Is it Champ Clark? Who you testified to? Comments that uh, that the chair does not go down to where the clerks are tallying the vote. And that they wouldn't do it. Wouldn't know how to do it. Uh, to paraphrase the quote. Um, and so I, I guess the, the first question I would have, and then I have a couple follow-ups on on your, your testimony, Mr. Johnson, is could you both speak to, the, in the very broadest terms, to what that language of the rule means and, and, and respond very broadly to the question, who controls the floor, who conducts a vote? Um, and by that I mean, is it the chair, is it the presiding officer, is it the parliamentarian, is it the clerk or his or her designee? Um, if, uh, Mr. Johnson, maybe you could. Say who controls. Uh, that perhaps that's a slightly a word slightly different than who conducts. But the, the rule obviously and properly puts control in the presiding officer, the speaker, or by extension the chairman of the committee of the whole by the rule that incorporates the speaker's responsibilities by reference. So the speaker in his or her nonpartisan capacity conducts the vote. I mean, it, can, it can't be any other way. And uh, the word controls the vote is perhaps a little bit more subjective, as, but ultimately, as I hope will be revealed, the, con the conduct and the control should, does and should remain in the chair. Now, the, uh, the fallback, uh, you read, uh, Mr. Pence, from the, uh, what has been the rule since electronic voting, that the presumption and the expectation is that the electronic system will be utilized in, de in preference to the, uh, to the roll call, the, the standby procedures of roll call or still recorded tellers because it's, uh, it's more accurate. I mean, the, the presumed infallibility of the electronic system has been consistently documented by rulings that are, that are in this very, uh, in the small print that uh, just below the segment you read, which suggests that uh, unlike old roll call votes where members could come in and ask unanimous consent to change their votes after the vote because they claimed that the tally clerk had not heard their response. So there was the element of human infallibility or human fallibility uh, there that allowed the chair to entertain unanimous consent request for members who perhaps very often had not been recorded, but who claimed that they were in the chair, were trying to vote, and had not been heard by the tally clerk. And under the old roll call system, those votes were allowed to be cast as long as they didn't change the result. And they weren't going to be allowed to come in the next day and say, I'm recorded as not present, I voted aye. You know, I want the record, I want the permanent record to change to show what the vote was. You all know now a member can come in and have his his or her statement appear immediately following the vote, but not change the result. But the and the correct interpretation from Speaker Albert on forward was that the presumed infallibility of the electronic system should uh, eliminates that perhaps fiction of members claiming that they weren't heard, and that's been honored. Again, that's a usage. I mean, you'll have, it's and it's it's been it's. Maybe more than that, it's precedent where chairs have relied invariably uh, on the on the uh, accuracy of the system, coupled with 
the ability of members to verify their votes at any and all voting stations. It's that responsibility that the speakers have imposed on members, not, again, not black letter, that the speakers have imposed on members to verify their votes. Together, that practice and, uh, has built up since 73 to where the, uh, the electronic vote is presumed infallible and almost conclusively presumed. There was only one glitch of all and all the time I can remember, and it was it involved an anomaly which where Mrs. Roy Ball Allard's vote mysteriously appeared in a vote. It wasn't decisive, but she was clearly not there, and she said so. And for some, they couldn't, as you probably learned, you can trace stations and cards all the way through a vote. They couldn't find that her card had ever been inserted, yet there was her name shown electronically. And Bill Thomas and the House Administration Committee did a, uh, did a uh, formal investigation and came back with a technical explanation that the anomaly may have happened electronically for some uh, very strange reason. It wouldn't ever happen again, and the House accepted that. Let me, let me interrupt if I can. You, you started out by responding um, that, that, that uh, the difference between controls and conducts. And, and uh, in your statement that, to, that obviously the chair ultimately under our system of government controls. Uh, I recognize that point. But specifically, who conducts the vote? Uh, under the rule? Who, uh, in terms of, of the history, the tradition, the express rules? Um, because it tally seems by... The at the direction of the chair. The tally clerks at the direction of the chair conduct the vote. Um, and, and they conduct the vote in the manner, as we've heard in previous hearings and heard you describe, uh, by the assembling of the vote. Um, you testified that that's traditionally been a non-partisan process. Um, was there a time in the history of the institution, I, I thought I, I, you seemed to imply that there was a, a time where there was a Republican and a Democrat tally clerk, is that correct? I think there have always been two tally clerks, whether, in, in, whether more recently those tra old traditional patronage slots, patronage slots are more dis are dispersed based on merit and not necessarily on patronage, but even so, when the some of those old uh, patronage tally clerks, and I remember them, were very competent and very dedicated, and mm. you wouldn't know, have known which was uh, on whose patronage. But uh, but I, I guess Mark and Lorraine can speak better to their, their the pedigree. But as, as far as I know, the tally clerks were and continue to be appointed solely to do uh, the, the business of conducting. So appointed on a patronage basis. But you're saying as far back as you can see, there's always been a tradition of the tally clerk that conducts the vote operating in a non-partisan manner. And I, I say that not just as a casual observer, but as, as a, having been the parliamentarian deputy for many years, because that there's a de facto relationship, talking about conduct, mm -hmm. where the parliamentarian, as the agent of the chair, working with the tally clerks is a further assurance, hopefully, that the vote is being conducted correctly. So the, the clerks, while the clerks hire and, and supervise, clerks of the House supervise the, the operations of the tally clerk's office, yet there's always been a de facto tacit understanding, never, con never contested, but always amicable, that when those tally clerks are on the roster and conducting a vote, they will be taking the advice uh, and working with the parliamentarian, because the parliamentarian's role derives as the agent of the chair. Uh, Claire, did you want to speak to that broad question about, about who conducts the vote, what your understanding is, the chief tally clerk? Uh, Mr. Pence, we, I guess we would conduct the vote. Microphone. We would conduct the vote in a sense. Thank you if you lean into it. Okay. Uh, the witness lights on, I think, is for the OW. Oh, okay. Um, for conducting the vote, well, at the direction of the chair, we would initiate a vote. That's, I guess we would use the term. We would uh, open up the electronic voting system for the, the vote on the question at hand. 
And so we were at the direction of the chair when to initiate the vote and ultimately when to close it. So I guess in a sense we would be, at, like Charlie said, sort of an agent of the chair to, to uh, operate the system and uh, be there to make sure that all members are recorded and uh, all who desire to vote. So, at, so if I may, Mr. O'Sullivan, at, at, at the direction of the chair, you conduct the we would vote. initiate the vote. You initiate the vote, but then can you conduct the vote uh, in a manner that uh, oh. I mean, it, does the is it your understanding that the chair is in control, control of the conduct of the vote, or has that do you perceive that the conduct, the administration, the assembling of the vote has been is the purview of the clerk under the rules and under the tradition? Well, we we are there to make sure members are recorded that their votes are, are cast and recorded. Uh, let me, uh, I want to be sensitive to the balance of our panel, but let me ask a, a couple of follow-up questions. Thank you. Sure. Um, if I can, um, the, um, Mr. Johnson, again, you were talking about the electronic voting system during your previous testimony, and, and you used a litany. You said the assumption, the procedure, the tradition, the custom, and then I think I'd have to look at the record. You made a professorial sidebar, but then you came back to, uh, I think your phrase was, that the tally clerks was the custom. So, and Did I hear correctly in your testimony that this business of the tally clerks um, and, and their role and, and their assembling of the vote, that, that, that's the core of, of the way that a vote has been conducted and essentially certified throughout the history of the institution? Yes. Okay. That, that, that would reflect what I was trying to say. I didn't mean to be playing uh, semantic games between the distinction between control, control and conduct. As you'll discover if you haven't already, I suppose, there are always efforts to try to control the timing of a vote. Those efforts are resisted by properly by the chair with the tally clerks, uh, efforts that emerge from various parts of the chamber. So the term control, in that sense, perhaps has a more loaded meaning than I meant to, to convey. I'm not trying to say that the chair is susceptible to any kind of influence uh, as far as which would uh, eliminate the accuracy of the, of the vote. The, um, uh the last question was just uh, specifically on um, the incident you referred to in Deschler Brown, Volume 14, that took place in 1995. Um, I think you testified that the, in that instance, the tally clerk had handed a slip to the chair, and using the slip, the chair had announced the result. And then that, the next day, by unanimous consent, that vote was vacated and and the vote was retaken, is that correct? Yes. But, but the chair had taken, had called the vote as a consequence of the, what would be called the ordinary operation of the tally clerk's role. I think at the, as I recall it, I was there. At the moment that the clerk handed up the tally sheet, 213 to 214, those members were just beginning to emerge separately down the side aisles, and the clerk, uh, had processed every other vote up until that moment, and it was handing up the slip when those members, the chair hadn't finally announced the result. It said the amendment is not agreed to. The chair had not yet announced that, but the chair, with the slip in his hand, which I think had been properly handed up at that moment, relied upon the slip. Uh, last, uh, uh, this really is the last question, and I'll yield back to the vice chairman. Uh, you made a very interesting statement about there had been a long period in the history of the institution where there had not been appeals of the ruling of the chair, um, if I heard you correctly, yes. and that there has been, in your words, a proliferation of appeals. Um, 
I'd, I'd love I'd love to have, and I certainly wouldn't ask the chief tally clerk to respond to this. Why why is uh, this that important? I mean, many people looking in, frankly, many members on the floor would think, well, you disagree with the chair, we appeal the ruling of the chair. But it, I thought that you implied in your statement that that there was something extremely important uh, that that uh, is, is reflected in that time in history when people did not appeal rulings of the chair. And I wondered if you might elaborate on that. Pence, I was trying to make the point, maybe it seems self-serving, but it, it shouldn't, uh, that appeals began to proliferate not because members were uh, were in disagreement about the accuracy of the chair's ruling, but rather to perhaps establish voting records, and this has gone on with appeals from both sides, uh, voting records on the underlying proposition, where, say an amendment would not have been in order because the Rules Committee prohibited it. Uh, there have been several occasions where the members have offered such an amendment anyway, knowing it was going to be ruled out of order, and then appealing the ruling of the chair as a demonstration, perhaps, of uh, frustration with a rule that might be governing that particular. And But the notion that appeals would be used to establish voting records, which could then be perhaps spun in various circles, uh, mm -hmm. uh, members being for and against a proposition, where the real vote was on the propriety of the chair's ruling. And when appeals began to come creep back in, uh, when Bob Michael was, was uh, minority leader, he would support the chair. He would never support an appeal uh, from his side if he thought the chair's ruling were correct. And uh, in the first uh, few years, uh, I think the more institutionally minded members would, regardless of party, would support the chair. It seems to have become a more and I don't want this to necessarily reflect to say that and there can be an appeal from the chair's number announcement uh, because there are precedents that say the chair's count uh, for a quorum cannot be appealed. Right. The chair's statement of the numbers uh, cannot be appealed directly. I mean, there is that new rule, though, which you'll be, I suppose, asking about, and I'm not the expert, which says the chair cannot hold a vote open solely change the outcome. Well, but you're saying that what was in the history of the institution only utilized when there was an actual question about the tally of the vote uh, or the interpretation of the rules has turned into more of a substantive opportunity to record objection to the content, and that, that's a helpful clarification. Uh, I, I thank my colleagues and, and uh, yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pence. Let me try to actually pick up, Mr. Johnson, on an observation you made earlier. You were, in your exchanges with uh, the chairman, Mr. Delahunt, you were drawing distinctions between custom practices, precedents, and the formal textual rules of the House of Representatives. I don't want to dwell too much on the difference, but I want to make one observation and perhaps get you to respond to it. One of the issues whenever the House or a committee of the House examines the propriety of a presiding officer's actions is obviously whether or not there was a violation of the rules or whether perhaps there's a violation custom and practice. And those of us who are lawyers are familiar with the idea of notice. And one of the governing concepts in the civil and criminal world is that you're on notice as to whether your conduct is actionable or in violation. The strongest kinds of notice exist when someone violates a textual rule. I assume you'd agree with that. Um, something is written down. Uh, if you're in a position of responsibility, you're often presumed to know the written rules, the written obligations. And it's possible for someone to take you through the text and then through the history of interpretation of the text. If the allegation is that a custom and practice was violated, it strikes me that may, by definition, raise some problems from a notice standpoint. Uh, I think you probably agree with me that the body of custom, practice, precedent, because it's not necessarily captured in one place, 
because it's based on contingencies and given subjective interpretations, it may be harder to flesh out a textual definition. It may be harder to say what a violation is. We have a rule book in front of me right now. If I'm alleging that someone violated a rule, I can point to a clause and to a page and to a text, and I can say that your actions didn't comply with that. If I'm saying that you violated a custom or a practice or a precedent, it strikes me that may be harder. Can you react to those observations of mine? I agree with all those observations. It may be harder to respond by finding, by looking for text to put something in context. Not necessarily impossible. And that's why I, I tried to anecdotally suggest that when I, I just put myself in the position of, a, of somebody who at the chair would want to know whether any speaker had ever opined about the role of the tally clerk, I came up with it on kind of a random, maybe not random, I mean, it was research done by me yesterday in, the, in Heinz and Cannon's uh, uh, index, volumes 9 through 11 are, are a great index. Under, under the category yeas and nays. And, uh, and there was a little caption that led me to the actual precedent I just read. And so to that, it, but it, it didn't, you know, it, it wasn't as immediate as, as looking for a black letter uh, arrangement in the, in the rule book. Now, the, the, the small print that follows this and other rules are, are citations virtually all to, with, with uh, record uh, either volume and section citations, or if those are not yet, because they're recent, if they're not yet published in the precedence, they are citations to permanent record pages. But, and, and if it's the speaker's own ruling, he or her, his or her name, Speaker Pelosi, Speaker Hester, name will appear in parenthetically next to the citation. If it's any other member, if it's the Speaker Pro Tem or Chairman of the Committee of the Whole, there will not be a citation to the, uh, to the but in any event, it's, it's more difficult. I would dare say there are fewer people, certainly fewer members, and perhaps fewer staff who take the time and have the inclination to begin to research some of these uh, small, still black letter, uh, black letter usage and tradition descriptions to find them. But it's not always impossible. But I don't, I don't disagree with your character. The rules are much more available to members and presiding officers than the customs, practices, and presidents of the House would be. Just as a general rule, I assume you'd agree with that, in terms of being able to resort to one readily as opposed to the other. Readily right. resort, yes. And let me go back to the 1995 example, because I think it's instructive for obvious reasons, and it's one that perhaps uh, most of my colleagues were not familiar with. Uh, some of us on this panel have been here fairly recently. Some members were here in 1995, uh, but there may be perhaps one member of this panel who's here in 1995. Um, as I understand the scenario, there was a, the Republican majority controlled in 1995 after the 94 elections. The presiding officer obviously was a Republican, and as you describe it, there was a tally sheet, 214 to 213. The presider properly handed it to the presiding officer apparently an accurate reflection of the recorded vote. As the presiding officer reaches out to pick up the tally sheet, two members of the minority, two Democratic members, come forward, apparently manifesting an intent to vote. Apparently their vote had not been recorded. It wasn't a matter of a change. The vote had not been recorded. The presiding officer chose to not do them the courtesy of recognizing them. There was consternation on the floor. There was a motion to adjourn. Apparently, some discussions back and forth between leadership. The next day, the vote was set aside. As I understood your responses to Mr. Delahunt, <clears throat> there was no privilege resolution. Did I understand that correctly? There was no privilege resolution around that dispute? It, it didn't seem necessary to either side of leadership. The minority leader, as brief as he was, uh, used uh, back channels, you might say, the British description, uh, the usual channels to get it referred to. Was there a textual rule that you understood to have precluded the presiding officer's actions of that day, on that day? Uh, a textual rule, no, because uh, he had this, I mean, he was announcing based on a temporary certification from the clerk, so I don't think there was a textual rule. It was a matter of uh, 
again, custom and tradition of the chair being fair. And then just to stop you on that point for a moment, I think it's a very important distinction. You would certainly agree that in 1995, then as now, there was no textual rule referring to the courtesy of recognizing members who wish to vote. No, that was is it's covered by the text then and now, is well, it? Well, only unless you point to the first clause of the Code of Conduct, which says that all members, including the sure. chair, shall conduct themselves sure. at all times. Sure. I mean, which is a general speaks volumes, but sure. it's not it's a part of the Code of Conduct. There's no precise rule. Sure. But but there's no then and now, there's no provision of the rule that specifically states that if a member manifests an intent to change a vote, there's no rule that really governs that scenario in a specific kind of way. Let me point further to consistent opening day announcements of policy by speakers going all the way back to Speaker Gingrich. Because Speaker Gingrich, I, I apologize for not having, I, I assumed I was going to be asked this specifically, but through the early 90s, votes were held open Terminably, because members could signal to the cloakrooms that they're on their way, and the chair, the tradition grew that the chair would honor members who had asked that their vote be held open. And the business of the House was being impacted adversely. And one of the first things on opening day that Speaker Gingrich announced was that he was going to, that, that himself and all uh, occupants of the chair were going to adhere to a strict 17 minute cutoff because they wanted to change members' behavior. And you have to do it with some consequence in mind. You can't just urge them uh, and say, that, oh, I announced this opening day, but you know, please come on over. They, you know, the consequence was that if you weren't there, uh, the chair was going to have a slip and announce the result based on the vote at that moment in time. But it would be by a slip. But the chair also said, and has continued to say to this day, Madam Speaker's statement on January 5th, 07, was the chair will never disenfranchise, in effect, disenfranchise his constituency by not allowing a member in the well to vote or change his or her vote. So that consistent policy has been mm -hmm. underlay. And it, so that's black letter. Okay. And that's underlay every Congress, Republican or Democratic speaker. Let me follow up on that before I move to my next area of questions. And your experiences in the House, from what you recall, how many instances were there privileged resolutions involving alleged violations of custom practice and precedent? Do you recall any instances? I would say, again, they proliferated. Uh, perhaps one of the most memorable is the collateral challenge to the three-hour vote by questions of privilege from the minority leader on more than one occasion even going over into the next Congress that was, that was still here from that vote. And so, again, I'd say uh, the questions of privilege, you have to distinguish what can a question of privilege do and not do. It can't be a substitute for a rules change. You can't, you can't have a question of privilege say that the rules should have said this when it didn't. So questions of privilege have been ruled out of order when their attempts to change the rules or their interpretation. Questions of privilege go to the, the dignity and integrity of proceedings. The, the question sometimes is, what is the, uh, what is the resolve clause trying to do with that issue? In the case of the three-hour vote, it was to refer to a committee to investigate and to assert that it should never happen again. This has one quick question about that. How many instances do you recall privilege resolutions challenging an action of a presiding officer in terms of calling a vote? I don't know that I've seen any. Uh, you know, other than in the aftermath of what happened August 2nd, there were other questions of privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm asking for prior to August yeah, 2nd, if you recall it. I would say that there's a can't, as, as we speak, I can't, I can furnish that to the record, uh, suggest that uh, a question of privilege, uh, we had one, I can remember, Tip O'Neill is in the chair, on whether the a roll call vote should be, the television should cover the floor during mm -hmm. the vote. That was offered as a question of privilege mm -hmm. the next day. 
but, but with respect to the very narrow question, uh, I take it your answer is that you don't have any recollection today of an instance when a presiding officer's calling of a vote was challenged for a privilege resolution. No, because the, the, the avenue is there most of the time for an immediate appeal. Okay. And, and just to clarify, a member can stand up and move for reconsideration of the vote. Yeah. That's one avenue. Uh, and you mentioned the other avenue and formal discussions between leadership to move for unanimous consent to set the vote aside. That's yeah. another avenue. Let me turn to the rule that was added by the new majority in the House, and I believe January of this year. It's a one sentence addition to Clause 2A of Rule 20, and this is the text, quote, a record vote by electronic device shall not be held open for the sole purpose of reversing the outcome of such vote. The language is interesting because, frankly, in my experience, a lot of members don't actually know the language. They know that we did something to address the lengthy vote delay regarding the 2003 Medicare bill. And just, just by way of anecdote, I did, even in discussing this provision, a number of members will say, well, my understanding is that the vote can't be held open for the purpose of influencing the vote. That's not actually what's written here. Uh, not only is the word influencing not used, the word purpose is not used without the modifier so. A number of members will anecdotally say you can't hold open the vote for the purpose of changing the outcome. <coughs> that is an inaccurate statement of the rule. Uh, many formulations that I've heard anecdotally do not accurately state the rule. The rule says for the sole purpose of reversing the outcome. So let me raise two scenarios of both of you and get some reaction. By definition, sole purpose seeks to inquire as to the presiding officer's intent. Um, and as all of us know, there can be multiple intents behind an action. Uh, someone could decide to leave a vote open with one possible intent being influencing the outcome or reversing the outcome. One could have another intent of leaving a vote open to allow members to think about changing their votes or to reconsider on both sides. Obviously, both sides are sitting there capable of being lobbied by the members and capable of changing. A member could leave a vote open for those two reasons and have a, or a presiding officer could leave a vote open for those two reasons and have yet a third in mind that perhaps there's a member who's not here and we don't know where that member is and, and that member could be in route, that member could be in Maryland, that member could be in the tunnels. Uh, a member could have, a presiding officer could have the fourth instinct that I'm uncertain whether or not there are members who are attempting to change their vote. I see motion in the well. I'm not sure if people are moving around or if they are moving toward changing their votes. All of that said to say the rules seem to focus very clearly on exclusivity of purpose. And they preclude an exclusive or they forbid a particular kind of purpose. But by definition, it seems to me that the rules contemplate that a member or presiding officer to be motivated by multiple factors. Let me get you to respond to that. Does, does that make sense to you? Yes. Yeah. It's that men's ray of the chair. That's the test yeah. of whether this rule, and who, who what rules on it? The chair of the sure. herself. The chair presumably knows its intent. No one else, because others can claim to know because they've seen pressures brought to bear externally. But it's the chair's intent as discerned by the chair at that moment in time as the vote is being kept open, which raises the question, what happens if, I, I've seen, I think, uh, that there have been several parliamentary inquiries in this Congress under this rule during the pendency of a vote, which in both two or three cases that I've seen, the chair has overruled, uh, it's been a parliamentary inquiry, maybe it's been a point of order. Uh, where the chair has overruled the point of order or responded to the parliamentary inquiry that, the, that the, either the tally clerk has not yet finished processing changes or the chair is aware that other members mm. are on their way. And so those, those are matter, those are statements of public record showing that the chair has can and does have other considerations in mind. And as you understand the rule, Mr. Johnson, there is no provision in the rule which requires the chair to declare, or the presiding officer to declare his reason 
for delaying a vote. There's no provision that anywhere requires a statement of intent on the part of the chair. To the contrary, I think that would be inappropriate for right. the chair. And it's certainly that there's no custom practice rule, and to the contrary, would be enormously unusual. Let me let me point out, Mr. Davis, that in this Congress, uh, with the adoption of this rule, I, as, as the chairman said, I'm under contract as a consultant with the parliamentarian to work on the president, but I'm very close to the parliamentarian and his staff, and I honor them. They're dear friends, and I, I do everything within appropriate to uh, to tell people when asked that they're doing the right thing and they should be supported. But the question of how you challenge an alleged point of order under this rule is very difficult because it comes, presumably, as it has twice, during a vote, which is in progress. And if there's a chair says, I overrule the point of order because that was not my sole intent, or just I overrule the point of order, and some member appeals the ruling of the chair, there, the system is incapable, as I understand it, of allowing a, a vote to be conducted within a vote. So the system would not allow a dispositive vote on the appeal from the chair's ruling, if it ever comes to that, and hopefully it won't. So when, if at all, is the point of order cognizable? Is it only, is it immediately following the announcement of the result where an appeal, I mean, I think it does constitute an, a, a question of order from which an appeal can be taken. Now, there is some... Uh, let, me, let me slow you down for one yeah. second before you go up an example, because I <clears throat> want to move through and give other members a chance to ask questions. Let me pose one last question to you before I go to Mr. LaTourette. It deals again with the text of Clause 2A of Rule 20. As I've said earlier, a number of members mistakenly believe that it says changing the outcome, influencing the outcome, altering the outcome. It says reversing the outcome. So again, let me give you a scenario, which will be my last question, and get you to react to it. I could imagine a vote being kept open. Let's say the number is 214 to 213. That's the number on the board. That's the number at that time, as far as the presiding officer knows. I could imagine a scenario in which a presiding officer leaves that vote open for an extended period of time. There is an outcome that is on the board that's not yet been rendered final. One side is leading 214 to 213. Presiding officer keeps the vote open. I can certainly imagine that there might be a challenge in that instance on the theory that the numbers are up. There's no one attempting to change the vote. Mr. Presiding Officer, you're keeping the vote open simply for the purpose of reversing the outcome. That's one scenario. <clears throat> that kind of scenario seems to be expressly covered by this rule. You can't reverse something which has not yet occurred. Um, there's another scenario that a vote is tied, that there is no outcome one way or another. It's an even situation. There is an outcome. Well, we, that's right, because the motion does not carry if it's tied, but there's also a tradition and custom, as I understand it, of uh, giving members a chance. Well, as I understand it, the preference is for there to be a margin one way or another, and you can react to that in a moment. I understand the rules don't require that, but I want it to get your reaction whether or not that's the custom. If, for whatever reason, the vote is tied, um, and that, that seems to me to be a different scenario than if there is a one vote margin one way or another. Can you comment on that distinction? I believe I can, uh, because the rules, the black letter says, on, in case of a tie, the question shall be lost. Right. That is a result dictated by the black letter rule. And I don't think there's a mm -hmm. customer tradition that says, well, let's just wait and see if someone changes so it's not a tie, because it's more decisive. Okay. I don't think that I've never advised an occupant of the chair to wait and see if someone will change it from a time. But at 213 to 213, that would mean hypothetically that a motion to recommit would not carry. Yeah. So therefore, someone who keeps the vote open uh, to reverse the outcome, you'd have to create a scenario in which the motion carry, would you not? Because 213 and 213 means the motion fails. If the reversal is the key. Right. The exactly. Right. So again, very important point. Yeah. 213 to 213, the outcome would be that the motion fails. To reverse the outcome would mean that the motion would have to carry, correct? That's correct. 
and there's yet the other scenario of there being a 214 to 213 and the vote being kept open for the purpose of someone flipping votes and turning it the other way. Again, or that's someone else coming in. Sure. Because in either sure. scenario, either hypothetical, you've okay. got 435 people right. sitting there. On November 21st, 03, sure. all members were there. Okay. Let me go to Mr. Lafayette. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Johnson, for your testimony. I, I have three lines of <clears throat> inquiry, but before I get to those three lines, I want to follow up on uh, some items that Mr. Davis mentioned in his questioning, and specifically uh, Speaker Pelosi at the beginning of this Congress, I think that's what you're referring to, began with Speaker Gingrich. The uh, relevant part of her announcement is that members will be given a reasonable amount of time in which to accurately record their votes. No occupant of the chair would prevent a member who was in the well before the announcement of the result from casting his or her vote. And that's, that's what you're referring to, I think. Yes. Uh, and uh, again, going back to uh, the unfortunate event of uh, 1995, uh, that was included in Speaker Gingrich's opening statement as well. Yes. And so it could be argued that what the then occupant of the chair did was to violate the, the Speaker's opening statements by not permitting those two members of the minority who appeared in the chamber who were trying to vote from casting their votes. Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent that Speaker Pelosi's uh, opening day announcement be included in the record. Although, uh, one little nuance there, the members at the moment were not yet in the well. Right. They are in the chamber. And that's, you know, that the, the use of the word well means that they're in the chair's immediate view as opposed to coming down an aisle. But well, I, I, I would, in my mind, as a longstanding member, that's a distinction without a difference. Well, I, I you had people agree. trying to vote, which is the spirit of the speakers. And, and then the other one was on this, the remedy for a violation of Rule 2. If a point of order is made during the course of uh, a roll call vote, there is no opportunity to appeal the ruling of the chair. Isn't the answer that because it's hortatory that the remedy is a question of privilege? That's, that's, a, that's a precise question that I think the parliamentarian is looking at right now. Another <laughs> argument might be that it's subject to a point of order immediately following the vote, which if afterwards if the chair is overruled on appeal, that, that vitiates the vote. Doesn't necessarily change the result back to what it might otherwise have been. I, mean, I don't think anyone would suggest that if the chair were overruled in his decision that he wasn't holding the vote open solely to change the result, and the House disagreed with that, that that would immediately change the result. It may vitiate the vote by operation of the rule. I don't, that is a that's a matter of new interpretation, which I think is a but question of privilege could be another approach to it. And, and I have to say, I mean, having this new rule in place, I, I think Mr. Davis's questions really point to the fact that it's a rule that doesn't mean anything, because how are we going to ever crawl into the head of the person that's sitting in the chair in a reasonable fashion unless he or she admits it? I mean, I, it, it, it's a, a rule change that leaves well, me puzzled. it doesn't mean anything unless and until the House reverses the chair. That's right. Then it may mean something. Right. But, but you almost have, and this isn't a question, but a, a statement is you almost have to have the occupant of the chair say, yeah, I did it. I mean, yeah. okay. Um, I want to talk to you about the role of the presiding officer. Uh, and uh, on, on page 804, in reference to uh, a speaker, uh, speaker pro tem's obligation on the count of the division, and I think this applies to, to all. One of the suppositions on which parliamentary law is founded is that the speaker will not betray his duty to make an honest count on division. And then reference to your letter that you talked about in your testimony of May the 20th, 2004, on page two, the first full paragraph, you write, I believe that the longstanding tradition of the role of the chair in rendering impartial and proper decisions has been maintained and appreciated, despite the switch in party majorities and despite occasional efforts to appeal various rulings. It has been, it has been reassuring when bipartisan majorities understand and support the rulings of the chair solely on the basis of their propriety as nonpartisan institutional standards with precedential significance. And I think that's the paragraph that you were discussing with us yeah. earlier, and I'd ask unanimous consent that that be made part of the record as, uh, as well. What, what is, uh, you know, we, we all know that <clears throat> the Speaker of the House is elected by the majority party. The occupant of the chair are representatives of the Speaker, appointed by the Speaker. Uh, and so for the past 12 years, the occupants of the chair have all been Republicans. Since the beginning of this Congress, they've all been members of the Democratic Party. Can you describe, from an institutional standpoint, what is the role of the presiding officer? Is he or she a partisan? Is he or she a Democrat in, in the way that they conduct the business? Are they uh, combatants during debate, or are they above the fray? 
I would say they're not, they are above the fray, they should be. Uh, they're not combatants, they don't participate in debate, they're not supposed to. Uh, and regardless of the partisan nature of the person appointed, now that we've always been very uh, uh, consistent with the speaker's votes, regardless of who the speaker has to be, the staff who ask people to preside, that they look at certain guidelines, uh, whether the member is on the committee handling the bill, for example, whether the member is competent. And that's not information we publish, but the fact that so-and-so is in the chair and so-and-so isn't might be an indication that the speaker's people believe that our advice about who's being called upon to preside uh, has been heeded. Now, that it's not always the case. I mean, there are members who appear and disappear from, into and out of the chair unbeknownst to the parliamentarians or, you know, where did this member come from? But the, the important point is once that, that person is in the chair, that the, the, an immediate conversation becomes appropriate between the parliamentarian and the presiding officer, whether it's someone brand new or somebody who has partisan stripes or whatever, to try to assure and anticipate problems so that if the member feels that he or she cannot be nonpartisan going forward, and in, again, anticipation in this role is absolutely essential. You have to be able to look forward down the road to see what might be happening on the particular I issue and whether the person in the chair can render. And, and I, I have asked people, I, I'm not embarrassed to ask some members in the chair, do you feel you're appropriately in the chair at this point? And so, usually they say yes, but sometimes they'll not even be aware that there's a potential perceived conflict, not an actual conflict. And so uh, that conversation, and it's, it's in confidence. I, when, on your walkthrough the other day, you probably saw the, uh, the mute button. Did John demonstrate? He did not, Absolutely. but maybe you could describe that. The essential importance of the button along the edge of the roster, which allows the chair and the parliamentarian to have a conversation, unheard by two systems that go out in-house or television. And that, the utilization, proper utilization of that button, if, if you know the light is on, because the light will show if the microphone is off. If you, and to be able to have that conversation is essential. But the characterization of the chair's role as nonpartisan, uh, I believe, I don't think, it, I can't naively believe it. You have to, I have to believe it in my heart that uh, occupants of the chair uh, should be advised if they're not inclined to be above the fray. Right. Uh, let, let me get to uh, something else. And you, you talked about the preparation of tally sheets and, and the, the uh, speaker in 1918 making some observations. If, if the staff could put up, during our walkthrough the other day, the, the press and the public was not with us, and so we have purloined some uh, tally sheets, and, and I just want to uh, have a tally sheet displayed, and then I have some questions. Is that something you recognize? Yeah. Charlie, okay, and 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 that that is the tally sheet that that's currently in use by the United States House of Representatives. Charlie, yeah. Mr. Yeah, sure. Butcher, it's bigger. We <laughs> we we refer to that as we would call that a, yay, a page from a yay nay pad. Okay. Uh, when we slip. refer to the yeah, when we refer to the tally sheet, it's the preparation for the call of the roll. It's, okay. a, it's another document that okay. we use traditionally now for the election of the speaker, but. If we had to call the roll, we would use what we call a tally, tally sheet. sheet. Okay. So, so what do we call this? A slip? Um, I always call that a slip from the A&A &A pad, but okay. uh, and if, it's, it's, if it's a tally sheet, it's, 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 people are familiar with it, that's fine. Okay. So, so what, whatever it's called, this is the document that the standing tally clerk prepares at the conclusion of the vote. That's correct. Okay. And, and Charlie, or Mr. Johnson, during uh, our walk through the other day, we had the opportunity to speak with the current parliamentarian in the House, Mr. Sullivan, and he indicated at port, page 43 of, of the transcript, uh, not in response to any question, but he says, may I say something about the production of this slip? This is probably the most important quality assurance process step in the process, because when I get that slip, I know that the numbers that are written on that slip came from a voting system that was closed to further input at the time that those numbers were written down. 
I have two questions. One, do you agree with Mr. Sullivan's observation about the importance of the slip? Yes. And what is your understanding of the significance of that slip uh, in a vote? It's a de facto certification from the tally clerk and from the entire clerk's operation transmitted to the chair that there are no more uh, changes or being processed into the system. That as far as that clerk is certifying at that moment, and those moments change, that the slip handed up is the, is, uh, the result as the system has absorbed it with no other cards being processed at that moment. So it, it's the clerk certification pursuant to Rule 20 to the chair through the parliamentarian that that's the accurate count on the vote? Yes. In your 40 years uh, as parliamentarian or in the parliamentarian's office, uh, including the 1995 episode that we have, have talked about, are you aware of any recorded vote conducted in the United States House of Representatives where a slip or a tally sheet has not been transmitted by the clerk to the chair? No. Uh, there have been some belated kind of simultaneous transfers as the chair is reading, and this is happening, uh, the, the clerk is handing up a slip. The parliamentarian is looking at it, perhaps, as the chair may be reading from the board because the board says finalized. And if there's any discrepancy, and I believe I remembered, Mark, you have to correct me, where if the chair is reading numbers, that for whatever reason don't coincide with what's on the slip, we hit the mute button and say to the chair, this, this is not being corroborated by the slip. But, but then let, let me ask you that. If, if there were an instance where a slip is never transmitted by the clerk through the parliamentarian to the chair, how could the chair call the vote? could in fact or how could properly properly well I would urge that that there would be no other proper alternative to the calling to the announcement of the numbers and the announcement of the result and I think I, I hope John made it clear that it's the announcement of the result not necessarily the characterization as final on the board. It's not, and not necessarily the recitation of numbers. I can't count the number of times when the chair has read numbers only to have the tally clerk say, here's another slip. Sure. These are the, the up to the moment numbers and have that happen many times in one vote. But uh, I can't uh, imagine a, a, a way because the, this is the machine, unless the machine is inoperable somehow as, as at the last second, tally clerk reports an inoperability. I can't imagine the chair is doing anything other than following uh, uh, certification from the clerk. Mr. Lauder, if you would yield for a moment, let me just inform the panelists and the members there has been one vote that's been called, a motion to adjourn. Um, obviously, we are at the very beginning of the 15 minute point. I suspect the vote will be up in real time, for probably at least about 20 minutes or so. I would propose uh, that, Mr. Lauderdale, if you are near the end of your questions. I have one more. Okay, that we go to you, that we stop so we can cast this vote, adjourn for about five or ten minutes or so, and then reconvene. Okay, I, and, and I appreciate that. And I, I have one more line of questioning, and I hope I can complete it in about ten minutes. Uh, the issue of pressure uh, on the occupant of the chair. And during your testimony, you indicated uh, what the note that I made is that it's not uncommon for influence within or without the chamber to be attempted to be placed upon the chair, the, the occupant of the chair. And what I wrote down, you said, is properly rejected. And what, what do you mean by that? I mean, I think there's a distinction between uh, when the chair receives a signal, it's usually a signal, either verbal or some other way communicated from the majority leadership. Right. The chair in that is obviously pointed by the majority, that as they view their monitor, uh, to their, from their perspective, if the chair can stop the vote, he should. Mm -hmm. Not that he must. Right. Not that he's going to be excoriated by the speaker if he doesn't, but 
that from the <coughs> leadership's perspective, they would prefer that the, either the vote stay open. You know, that there are signals that uh, maybe they're not the same signals this or this or whatever they have, they have been over time. Uh, that uh, that suggest to the chair what the leadership would like to see, consistent with a, a proper call of the result. Well, but, but what what do you mean by you indicated that that's not uncommon? I've I've seen it. We've all seen it. Yeah. What did you mean by the phrase "properly rejected"? And and by that, I'll tell you what I took you to mean, and you can tell me if I'm uh, wrong. I think it means that the chair, if the chair knew that there was that the vote was not final, right, he would properly reject and. Uh, the importuning of the leadership to shut the vote down. And then, and then on, on the issue of pressure, Mr. Davis in his questioning talked about the difference between black letter law and the rules and precedent and, and the notion that, I, I don't know if all of us are lawyers, but I, I think most of us are, that, that there's notice. And so you really can't be punished for conduct that you didn't know was, uh, was wrong. When there is a person in the chair, what's the interaction between the person in the chair and the parliamentarian in terms of advising the occupant of the chair that they are comporting with the rules, customs, tradition, usage of the House. Is there one? Yes, and I, I think I alluded to it earlier. It's preferably, it's, it's a constant interaction, it's a, it's a confidential interaction, and it's an anticipatory interaction with, uh, in confidence, because we, don't want the chair, very often the chair is a new occupant of the chair, relatively new. We want that chair to do the right thing, and be perceived to be doing the right thing. So the conversation is ongoing. And the conversations begin before the person is appointed. Right. The, the best occupants of the chair, I think, if they're doing it for the first or second time, come for advice in advance as a, in a private tutorial, if you will. Or they may be asked new members to preside during special orders, during which time uh, any of the parliamentarians, uh, it, it's an honor to go out and talk to those members and to find out if they're interested in returning to the chair in a more, uh, in a more difficult role at some future time, but then to answer any and all questions. Not to be a lecturer, right. but to answer any and all questions. And then, and then my last question, on, in, you indicated during this 1995 vote <clears throat> that we've been discussing that you were, were you, were you the parliamentarian on the floor at that moment in time? Yes. And with that, did you offer advice to the occupant of the chair that, that he was engaging in behavior that was, uh, if not a violation of the speaker's announcement on opening day, certainly uh, maybe pull it, it back? so quickly uh, between that announcement uh, that, I mean, I, I did say there were members Them up and say you're wrong, you're doing the wrong thing, you're going to get in trouble. I didn't have that much presence of mind. I wish I had. Because of what happened so quickly. But would that be, have been an appropriate role for the parliamentarian? So, Mr. Davis, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. What we'll do is we will temporarily adjourn and we will reconvene. And since again, it's the chair's understanding that there is only one vote, and that members can quickly cast it and return, so that Ms. Hurst Sandlin and Mr. Holshoff have a chance to question. So. Uh, hearing is adjourned for 10 minutes. The chair reconvenes the hearing of the select committee um, and recognizes Ms. Hersett Sandlin. Oh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Johnson, thank you. It was, I think, 24 days after you retired that I arrived uh, to the Congress. And it's been fascinating uh, to listen to your responses to the members' questions this morning. I've learned an awful lot, as I think uh, uh, my colleagues have, and look forward to sharing uh, more information with others of my colleagues, especially those newer to the Congress. Um, I did want to pick up on the line of questioning that Mr. Uh, La Tourette was pursuing as it relates to the interaction between the parliamentarian and the presiding officer 
as time is drawing down and it looks as though, uh, in terms of the steps prior to calling a vote, could you talk a little bit about, you had mentioned uh, that there have been times where the chair is actually starting to read or has read the numbers, but then another tally slip uh, is presented. Can you talk about what leads to multiple tally slips being prepared and presented to a presiding officer? Uh, as the vote winds down, we have these cue cards on them. Some chairs uh, really read them, others have no experience at least thinking of. Chair first asks, are any other members wish to be recorded? That's all well experience. That. And only after that does the chair require that any members wish to change their votes. Now that, and I, whether it's still always the case, that question from the chair is a signal to the uh, tally clerk potentially to shut down the, the uh, voting stations and it has to change. But the, it, in practice, though, uh, now it, it's a cue, but uh, we don't immediately, if other members are appearing to vote, we don't immediately close the voting station. Even if the, that's right, if the chair has asked that and knowing that there are going to be a number of more members coming, clearly it's to everyone's advantage for the voting stations to stay open even after that chair's first day more. But once a slip is handed up and the chair begins to read from it, many times the tally clerk will say to the parliamentarian, because here's another slip. It's not because someone else has just come in. You wouldn't have given a slip initially until uh, he feels that everyone in the system has been, everyone he's in the system that they know about, either uh, by cards that have been submitted to the roster, the red or green or sometimes amber uh, cards are are either submitted because the member has forgotten his electronic voting card or because it's a change within the last five minutes uh, of a 15-minute vote. And until, and the tally clerk correctly compiles a list of changes, because changes are always announced, mm -hmm. Uh, as I recall, uh, by the by the uh, reading clerk who was given the list of changes by the tally clerk and read just prior to the announcement. And so that list of changes, obviously it goes into the record and is considered important contemporaneously because it shows leadership and other members who is changing and, and who is, you know, if you've changed in the first 10 minutes electronically, you're not going to be on that list. Or if it's a five-minute vote and you change electronically, you're not going to be on that list. But if you had to come into the well or submit a card, you will be on the list. And it's appropriate, I think, for changes to be shown. But even so, the, the, I don't think the tally clerk prematurely hands a slip up knowing there's still some processing to go on in the system. I don't ever recall that. But at certain moments where the tally clerk feels that he's cleared all the cards that are in, possession and mark them and preserve them, then a slip comes up. And very often, members will then appear to change or to vote if they, they may have been in the chamber but just not voting because they're uncertain. And so all of those uh, reasons perhaps account for new slips. Is that response? Yes, and so maybe perhaps both you, Mr. Johnson, and Mr. O'Sullivan, have you seen, we've talked about sort of the proliferation of things here in the last few years. As members, have you seen increased incidences in which members are going to the well to change their votes in far more frequency in the last um, few years than previously, or has it always been the case that there are a lot of last minute changes of votes in the well? Ms. Hurst, that's, it's, that's uh, a little bit difficult to answer. It depends on the roll call, the issue at hand. Uh, in general, I think the well votes have come down a little, members voting in the well a little bit. Uh, in 1995, uh, at this change in the Congress from the, when the, from the Democrats to Republicans, that for, at the beginning of that Congress, for some reason, we had an incredible number of well votes the first few months. 
And uh, the, to the point where it was being questioned, was this uh, so, sort of coordinated? We would have 40, 50 well votes a vote. Well, may I clarify, though? I, I'm asking specifically about, and you mentioned it's difficult to answer. It sometimes depends on particular role. Let me then clarify. Have you seen, um, within the last couple of years, increased incidences of members who had voted on the EVS or even in the well, who change their vote in the final moments or even after time has run out when voting on a motion to recommit? I would probably no, but with this caveat, a motion to recommit usually, uh, if a vote is going to create well votes at the end, it would be a, that type of motion. And if we, that, that would, that would, if we were going to have a vote that would cause a lot of well voting, it would probably be a motion to recommit or um, a motion where you get into sort of a double negative where people are not quite, if you have to vote yes, you're for it, or you're against it, or if you vote no, you're for it. One of those things. But And is it in those instances where there may be multiple tally sheets uh, that are prepared and submitted but ripped up at the slips? Yeah, excuse Could me. Be. Yes. Okay. And would it be your advice, Mr. Johnson, that the parliamentarian, you had said earlier in response to some question, that anticipation is the key and the conversations between the parliamentarian and the presiding officer. Um, would it be your opinion that there um, uh, should be a conversation uh, between the presiding officer uh, and the parliamentarian in anticipating uh, a incidents of changing votes in the final moments or after time has run out uh, on a particular motion, whether it's a motion to recommit or other type of um, I would urge role. that conversation if the chair were uncertain or hesitant to take an initiative. But hopefully, I can speak from experience, the best occupants of the chair are very uh, custom to viewing the scenario directly in front of them, that tally clerk's only a few feet away, they know that it's the tally clerk standing in the well who is talking to the tally clerk in the machine and then filling out the slip. And the chair sees that. And the best occupants of the chair don't need the parliamentarian to tell them, wait for the slip or wait for another slip, because they'll see and react to uh, the dynamic of that situation, at least uh, if they see members coming into the well or uh, if they see a dynamic where they think that the, the result may not be final on that slip, they'll look potentially for another slip. But that's not to say that there aren't occasions. I mean, probably there should have been more occasions when the parliamentarian conversation with the chair would have been helpful if not necessary. And you had said in response to um questions of Mr. LaTourette that while you couldn't recall another situation where the presiding officer called the vote before sort of the certification of the tally slip, you do recall sort of these simultaneous transfers when the chair was reading from the board because the board had final on it. Does the parliamentarian advise um, the presiding officer uh, that he or she should not refer to the board uh, at any point in the proceeding, but wait until the tally slip is presented? Yes, I, yes, I'd say, having been through so many of those votes, there are times when you're either distracted or not as attentive as you should be that to, to that precise moment. But the most important thing for the parliamentarian, talk about it in anticipation, is to prioritize what's most important at that time, because there are many times just one parliamentarian out there, there may be a potential for distraction uh, as members approach the chair and the parliamentarians trying to keep them at a distance. But that moment of priority uh, to pay attention and to advise the chair not to read, I mean, but there is there's a glance at the board and at the slip. And if they don't jive, and the chair happens to be reading from the board, 
and you're handing them up a slip that doesn't jive with it, you would stop it. But usually, almost always, it does what he's saying, perhaps off the board, assuming he's not reading from the slip, what he's saying off the board does jive with what he has been given in his hand. So he's talking about the contemporaneousness of that transfer. Uh, usually it's not a problem, but it can certainly potentially be a problem. So when there's any doubt, brought to the parliamentarian's attention, or to the tally clerk's attention, or to the chair's attention. They should stop and indicate to everyone that they're relying solely on the play. So if a presiding officer began to call a vote reading numbers from the electronic board, and the parliamentarian did not yet have a tally slip in hand, you would hit the mute button and advise the presiding officer that a tally slip had not been prepared, final, didn't occur yet on the board? That would be the proper role of the parliamentarian, whether it's done in all cases. Uh, you know, there's so many mitigating factors, and they're not excuses, but that's, that should be the role of the parliamentarian. And then, Mr. O'Sullivan, if I could come back to you, how again is it, I know we, we talked some about this, uh, in the walkthrough. But given that Mr. Johnson did make reference specifically to final, that there have been these simultaneous transfers and the, the presiding officer may be looking up at the board and sees final, how again is it that the seated tally clerk makes the decision to put final? Has, is it because a tally slip has been prepared? No. Uh, Mr. Said, no, the, the word final should appear after this presiding officer has announced the tally and uh, had disposed of the issue at hand. If the motion to reconsider is laid on the table, or if there's no motion to reconsider, for example, in the case of an amendment, the amendment is not agreed to, and they move on. At that point, the word final normally appears. Now, there's been instances where, right, as I think John Sullivan mentioned, you get to that final period where a member presents themselves in the well. And the presiding officer many times will uh, allow that member to be recorded. So then at that point, the word final may have been appeared because the tally clerk hit, that, hit the, the key mm -hmm. to begin to exit the system. If you hit final and exit, then you release the displays, which in fact you exit the system. If you hit the word final, you still can input votes. And so that's sort of the situation sometimes. Which, sometimes. which occurred on, on roll call 814, because I believe that there were still cards that the seated tally clerk was entering and processing into the system after final um, appeared. I, I, wasn't mean, there, I wasn't there that evening. So okay. um, I don't want to speak for the okay. person that was there, but. And we'll revisit, but Jen, you, you've explained how that can occur. It's possible. Okay. Um, May I say something, Mr. Yeah. Uh, I would say it's rare. It's, it's rarely, it happens rarely, but it, it can happen where the word final is up, <coughs> it appears and votes are, are still entered. But, but the, normal, the normal 98, 99, probably percent of the time even higher is to wait until the final disposition of the question, and then the word final, and then release the OK. Mr. Johnson, do you recall what year um, Rule 19, uh, Section 2 on Motions following the amendment stage that the motion to recommit was added to the rules? Um, the, the guarantee of the, I'm sorry, would you repeat that question? In Rule 19, motions following the amendment stage, right. um, motion to recommit, do you recall what year? Mo a motion to recommit, that section was added to the written rules? Well, uh, an iteration of the current rule uh, 
became a rule to have some 1909. That was the Joe Cannon revolt. That was a huge issue because the speaker, Joe Cannon, was not only speaker, but he was chairman of the rules committee. And they were reporting rules denying recommittal motions and going right to final passage. And then probably as large a watershed moment as the House was faced in a procedural way, uh, the minority, uh, and then when motions to recommit were being offered, they were being offered by the chairman of the committee to make so-called sweetheart corrections in order to deny the opposition the right to offer a substantive motion. So after the canon, uh, after the, the amendment was made in 1909, uh, it pretty much stood, I think, as it, as it has until 1995, when the current rule was put in place and it was the result of a series of uh, motions to recommit, uh, which were restricted by the Rules Committee in the late 80s, early 90s. The Rules Committee, relying upon a 1934 ruling, felt even in the face of a uh, motion that said that there shall be one motion to recommit, the rule didn't say which shall both be allowed to contain proper instruction. And so the speaker, the speaker, Speakers Wright and Foley, I think correctly, but certainly uh, in difficult rulings. They're all appealed, they're all listed here. Uh, ruled that it was within the authority of the Rules Committee to bring a rule that, that uh, limited, but did not, as long as it did not totally deny a straight motion to recommit. And it was based on a 1934 precedent, which was really the only precedent of, in all the, all the years, but it was a proper basis, even though there were appeals. I to talk about the appeals beginning to proliferate. That was a watershed moment on the incidence of appeals. But if there it was a real dispute, with the minority, uh, the Republican minority, feeling that they were aggrieved that they, the Rules Committee was shutting down proper motions to recommit. So the Hamilton Breyer uh, Committee, after uh, a congressional reform in 93 94, Bipartisan recommendation of this, and then the, the Republican rules package in uh, January of 05 uh, is, uh, presented the current rule that focused on the minority leader or the designee, and that they could not be denied instructions in a motion to recommit if they were proper. And that's where the, that's the current uh, form of the rule. Thank you. Um, back to the tally slip. Uh, some of what we've heard about the circumstances regarding roll call 814 is that no tally slip was ever prepared. Can you recall any instance, Mr. Sullivan, in which a tally slip was never prepared for a roll call vote? No. Um, like Charlie said, there may have been a situation uh, where a member jumped the gun read the board as we were setting up the tally sweep shift up foot. And um, it was just proceeded to finalize, close the vote on, based on that basis. But uh, off the top of my head, I cannot recall a tally being sent out to us. But is it your understanding that the circumstances regarding, regarding roll call 814, even after there was an initial call by the chair almost simultaneous with the final appearing on the board, and then members who were in the well changing votes that continued to be entered after final was there. Is it your understanding that even after all of that, there was no tally slip That's right. ever prepared? That's right. Thank you. One final question, Mr. Johnson. After we integrated the electronic voting system in 1974 and the role of the tally clerks, I guess, as you stated um, at the outset of today's hearing, was never perceived to change once the electronic voting system was adopted. And I think you joined the clerk's office, Mr. O'Sullivan, four years later in 1978. Right. Do either of you ever recall any discussion either within the clerk's office or in the parliamentarian's office or 
in consultation with uh, prior speakers uh, or Speaker Pelosi as she assumed uh, the speakership this year of, again, going back to the, the issue of the infallibility of the electronic voting system, but recognizing the quality assurance that Mr. Sullivan pointed out in our hearing last week. Has there ever been a discussion about changing the manner in which uh, the tally clerks uh, or their responsibilities um, and the need for a tally slip uh, or addressing the situation of multiple tally slips in light of the electronic voting system and what it can provide the providing the presiding officer? Early in the uh, history of electronic voting, there were, uh, for the chair, I guess it was Speaker O'Neill, by that time, maybe it was Carl Alvarez, the first few, one or two years of electronic voting permitted members to change their votes as often as possible from voting stage, even up to the very final moment. And that was, as you can imagine, was leading to all kinds of uncertainty. There was still a slip. Tally clerks, and I, you weren't here, but the, the, the uncertainty of the result with no accountability, I and mean, there's going to be accountability the next day when people read the record, but they were not going to see who was making the last minute change from terminal X back in the last row, and votes would flip flop uh, arbitrarily and uh, unpredictably to the point where the speaker and the minority leader together, I guess it may have still been Carl Albert early in Tip O'Neill's speakership with the minority leader agreed that in the last five minutes of the 15 minute vote changes had to be more controlled as well so the tally clerks could uh, could get the changes in. Number one, there would be changes shown. There's that kind of discipline. The members weren't going to get a free ride not to show that they were on, off, on, off, on, off. Some were doing for that brief time. And that the tally clerk was going to have some time to pre prepare that list of changes as well as submit a slip. I don't have enough of a recollection, but there, there was never uh, the absence of a slip. The slips, I, I know, I have to guess, changed rather, rather quickly because votes would flip flop two and three times within seconds before that, that uh, adjustment. But otherwise, I don't think the role of the tally clerk uh, over time has ever been under discussion. In that the, the, the whole procedure of conducting votes and, and the closing of votes is almost the same since I've been here. Every vote has a little permutation, a little different because of members, members' arrivals and things like that. But the, whole, the whole idea is, is basically not the same. And I said that was, and I apologize to Mr. Holshoff. Just one final clarification on Mr. Johnson. You had stated um, that you thought it would have been the proper action, that you think it would be the proper action for a parliamentarian in the event a presiding officer starts to prematurely call a vote in the absence of a tally slip that provides quality assurance to hit the mute button and inform the presiding officer of that. Would it also be a proper action, in your opinion, for the parliamentarian then to converse with the tally clerks to ensure that a tally slip was ultimately prepared and presented? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Before the chair recognizes Mr. Hulsha, it appears there may be another vote that's being called, which uh, apparently is a motion to adjourn. Uh, Ms. Hulsha, let me ask you, how many minutes do you think your questions will take? Obviously, we've not enforced time limits today, but just so the chair is aware, how long do you think you'll need? Uh, I will attempt to conclude questioning to give us the opportunity to walk downstairs and vote. So if you'd let me go forward, perhaps I can okay. can conclude. Okay. Chair recognize Ms. Fulcher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, bringing up the rear, so to speak, uh, a lot of these questions have been asked, and so I'm hoping to tie up some loose ends. I guess the first one, uh, I, I would say, I know Mr. Delahunt uh, had another commitment, uh, is to submit for the record that Speaker Champ Clark 
uh, whose home county is now in the 9th Congressional District that I'm privileged to represent. Uh, I don't have this on first-hand authority, but my guess would be he would be part of Cardinal Nation, uh, not Red Sox Nation. So let me get that out early on. Mr. O'Sullivan, a lot, a lot of our focus has been on custom, precedent, usage, uh, and Mr. Johnson has received, I think, the bulk of the inquiries. Let me, again, just tying up a loose end, uh, you were extremely helpful during our walkthrough uh, last week. You spent over an hour with us. Again, that hasn't been part of, of the record per se, uh, but demonstrating for us specifically all of the procedures, the safeguards that the clerk's office has put in place in order to get to that certification. Uh, that, that was extremely helpful, and again, while you haven't had a lot of questions, let me just a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, you now have, I heard you in the last response, you now have adopted our verbiage that the tally slip, uh, even though the tally slip as you d designed is not, it, it, it's something other than this diagram that's just to your right, correct? Well, well we have the official tally sheet, which is the, okay. which we would use to call a roll if we had to. But for the presiding officer, this tally slip is the certification for the presiding officer. Is that true? Yes, sir. And reading from the board is not certification by the clerk. Is that also true? I would say yes. This okay. is what we say is the tally. Okay. Uh, and, and as you stated before, roll call vote 814, you were not present. Uh, this was during a one of the appropriations bills. There were a lot of amendments, and I think uh, you had already gone home for the night, recognizing that the next day was going to be another day full of votes, and to keep uh, a, a, a fresh clerk in the chair, you had gone home for the evening, and you were not there that evening. Is that right? Okay. Now, Mr. Johnson. Uh, I want to just supplement the record in, in some of the things that you've, you've referenced. For instance, uh, one of the things you referenced was Speaker Gingrich, uh, the, the practice of receiving signals from the outside uh, that, that Speaker Gingrich changed that policy, and in fact, in our rule book, that is reflected, is it not, on page 808 for those that choose to avail themselves of this, uh, that in essence, uh, about uh, two-thirds of the way down, starting in, I'm, I'm reading now, starting in the 104th Congress, the Speaker has announced that each occupant of the chair would have the Speaker's full support in striving to close each electronic vote at the earliest opportunity, and that members should not rely on signals relayed from outside the chamber to assume that votes will be held open until they arrive. And, and every subsequent Speaker including Ms. Pelosi, has adopted that yes. condition. True? Yes. Um, in fact, you also just referenced under Ms. Hersa Sandlin's question uh, this practice of, in the last flurry of votes being switched, uh, I think that is also referenced as precedent on page 109. I'm sorry. Uh, on page 807, in 19, about one-third of the way down, in 1975, Speaker Albert announced that changes could no longer be made at the electronic stations, but would have to be made by ballot card in the well, uh, and then further, that changes may be made electronically during the first 10 minutes, but changes during the last five minutes would have to be made by ballot card in the well. And so... That was the reference I made earlier to Speaker Albert. I, that, that confirms the Yes, sir. Uh, there's been some back and forth between uh, my friend Mr. Davis and Mr. LaTourette about the new clause in the rules about the reversal uh, or, or reversing the outcome. Uh, and in fact, at the bottom of page 807, uh, there, there have been some parliamentary inquiries concerning the rule on holding votes open for the sole purpose of reversing the outcome. Uh, 
and as it says at the top of page 808, the chair is constrained to differentiate between activity toward the establishment of an outcome on the one hand and activity that might have as its purpose the reversal of an already established outcome on the other. Uh, and, and so that is the quandary, is it not, as we determine, try to determine the state of mind of the presiding officer. Those three dates, Congressman, are the sole precedents in this Congress uh, and up to the time of publication of the manual. There may have been some subsequent, I don't know. But those three are worth examining to see whether all of them were just responses to parliamentary inquiries or any of them were points of order. It's safe to say none of them were appealed at that point. But that's the body of precedent, such as it is, that there is right now under this new rule. Again, to, to clarify a few points raised by previous questions, in this vote in 1995, uh, there was certification by the clerk, was there not a written tally sheet prepared prior to the presiding officer announcing the vote? You're nodding. Yes, I'm sorry. The first of what should have been several tally sheets, or at least another one, had been handed to him. That's okay. my recollection, where it said 213 to 214. And he immediately read from that, from that book as members, or two members were coming into the room. There's also been some, some reference to the vote on November 21st of 2003, uh, known as the Medicare vote. And I think you stated, and again, let me underscore this, that all members were present in the chamber, correct? In fact, do you recall, as I do, and I've, I've had the occasion to uh, personally examine that vote in greater detail in another forum, uh, that even after the period of three hours, or nearly three hours had passed, not all members had recorded their votes. Do you rec recall that uh, specifically? No, uh, I would say it was 2.16 to 2.18 for most of that three hour period with only one member who was present. Uh, who had not cast his vote. not cast his vote, right. And uh, everyone knew who it was. <laughs> Where he was. I, I, as do I. <laughs> Attacking him. <laughs> Uh, in the interest of time, then, let me get to the, the final uh, couple of questions that I have. And again, I'm, I was in the role of the presiding officer. Uh, in legal jargon, what comes to my mind is the neutral and detached magistrate that the law contemplates. Again, I'm talking about civil law, perhaps criminal law, and, and of course that doesn't necessarily fit concisely with our own rules. Uh, but that we are looking for that presiding officer to be that fair, that, that neutral and deta detached magistrate. Would you uh, agree with me? Uh, and you mentioned competency in the chair. And again, just as a point of reference, uh, when I used to work in the radio station, I had come from a campus station. Uh, I got stuck in the overnight time slot, midnight to six until I became a little more conversant, putting sentences together and what have you. In a similar way, and I think both parties have done this, newly elected members often get these special order times because there's often not controversial rulings that they would have to make, but it allows them to log time in the chair and to gain some experience, and then perhaps then they are prepared uh, to be in the chair during more uh, difficult times. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, there is something to the competence of the presiding officer. Is, is there a confidence level that you had as parliamentarian with certain members, probably of our group, we acknowledge Mr. LaTourette logged a lot of time, probably more than anyone on this select committee. Uh, is there a confidence level that comes with the parliamentarian deter depending upon who is in fact in the chair? Yes. Why, I mean, again, just why is that? I suppose it's human nature and experience. Not only a personal friendship that it may have developed, but it's a uh, respect that that if you, as the parliamentarian, are temporarily distracted or not attentive, whatever, that that occupant of the chair will presumably have has had enough experience and incentive to uh, to uh, take an initiative. And if a presiding officer who had extensive experience presiding over the body, even during some difficult times, uh, 
would most certainly, maybe not understanding all the precedent or the written precedent, but would certainly understand the custom, the usage, uh, the normal practice, the ebb and flow, if you will, uh, even during a very difficult uh, vote, would he not? Mr. Fellowship, for you near. Yes, sir. Uh, in fact, in the interest of time, if Mr. Chair, I would yield back. Thank you, Ms. Halshoff, and I appreciate that given I think we have about three minutes left on the vote at this point. Let me thank our two very able witnesses for being here and enlightening us today. Uh, all members and witnesses are advised that we have five minutes to supplement the record. Hearing of the select committee is adjourned. Five minutes or five days? Did I say five minutes? All right, five days. Five minutes be good too. The House Thursday passed a new version of the Children's Health Insurance Bill called S-CHIP. The vote was 265 to 142. 26 members were absent. President Bush vetoed an earlier version of the bill and says he'll veto this one too. moments, a look at the effectiveness of the so-called terrorist watch list. In a little less than two hours,